My name is Kendall Crullius, and I'm one of the many volunteers from Reading Odyssey and the Darwin 150 Project who are producing this program. Reading Odyssey is a not-for-profit dedicated to helping adults re-engage their intellectual curiosity through reading and discussing great books and ideas. Our founder, Phil Terry, is with us tonight, and you'll hear from him later during the Q&A session. I invite you to check out our website at www.readingodyssey.com to learn more about what we do. The Darwin 150 Project was created by the volunteers of Reading Odyssey and includes three main components. A series of five lectures this fall, of which tonight's program is the second. Our first lecture on the world before Darwin was given by Harvard professor Everett Mendelssohn and is available online at our website, www.darwin150.com. We also have a virtual reading group moderated by Stephanie Aktipas, who's a PhD in evolutionary biology at Harvard and a, the winner of the Derek Bach Award for Excellence in Teaching at Harvard. That group is Reading Origin of Species. We began last night, uh, and you can actually download that conversation from our website as well. Uh, we also have a very ambitious project, some would say quixotic, uh, to encourage one million people to join our Facebook group uh, about Darwin. We have over a quarter of a million members already, but we need your help to help us reach this ambitious goal. So please check out our website, www.darwin150.com, for information about all these activities. Uh, I want to welcome our audience here at Columbia and um, thank them for their flexibility because we just had to uh, move three floors to a different lecture hall. Um, I particularly want to welcome a very enthousi enthusiastic group that we have here from the Collegiate School here uh, with Dean Amy Bell. Yay, Collegiate! <laughs> Collegiate School is the oldest independent school in the United States, founded in 1628. That's really amazing. <laughs> I also want to welcome the thousands of people who are joining us by phone from across North America and also from Germany, Brazil, the UK, Portugal, Dubai, Mexico, Greece, Australia, and India. And in India, especially our friend Anil Kumar Chala, uh, who has been working with us to spread the word among scientists over there. We're grateful for his help. We're also delighted that a number of university schools and science museums are joining us with large groups who have gathered to participate in the program. Um, we want to say a big howdy to Texas A&M and welcome Middlebury, Iowa State, University of Maryland, McMaster University, the University of North Carolina, Illinois Wesleyan, University of Illinois, San Jacinto College, Baylor, and the Wagner Free Institute in Philadelphia. We expect there are more people uh, listening in groups, and we hope that you will email us and let us know that you're out there. We have attracted this large global audience using new media and social networks, and we urge all of you on Twitter to live tweet during the event with hash Darwin150. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. The people who are Twittering do, do know. Uh, and we want everyone to participate in the Q&A session after the lecture. So if you're not in this room, uh, you can email your questions to pterry at readingodyssey.com as you think of them, and Phil will pass some of them along to our speaker. Finally, I want to thank everyone who has made this program possible. Um, Professor John Dowling of Harvard, who is chair of the Darwin 150 pro project, who helped us design the program the ragtag global group of volunteers from Reading Odyssey and Darwin 150, our partners National Geographic, Citrix Online and their High Def Conferencing Division, Arizona State University's Darwin Fest, Campaign Monitor, Squarespace, the National Center for Science Education, the New York Academy of Sciences, Creation the Movie, which now has a U.S. distributor, hooray for that, and the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology. Um, I'm in just a moment going to give a brief introduction for our speaker, uh, Jonathan Weiner, who will speak for approximately 40 minutes, and we will then open this up to questions and answers uh, from the audience here at Columbia and around the world. Again, the email for questions is pterry at readingodyssey.com. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Jonathan Weiner uh, to be our speaker tonight. 
Um, Jonathan is an award-winning author who has a really special and unique gift for making science accessible to general audiences. And as an English major, I appreciate that more than I can tell you. Um, his books have won uh, countless awards, uh, and his book, The Beak of the Finch, I hope he's going to sign my copy tonight, won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Jonathan is a professor in the Graduate School of Journalism here at Columbia University. We are honored to have him give this lecture. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Weiner. Thank you very much, Kendall, and many thanks to you, Phil. Uh, Phil, Terry, and I have had many talks on the telephone, and this is the first time we've met this evening. I'm sorry to the audience. I appreciate your moving three floors and uh, staying with us. I'm sorry for the confusion there over the lecture hall. Those of you listening in haven't had to move around. I'm very glad that you're tuning in and listening. Thank you. It's an honor to be part of the Darwin 150 project. It's a thrill to be able to participate in celebrations around the world of Darwin's 200th birthday and the 150th anniversary of the origin of species. I just wanted to um, add that uh, if people are listening at Texas A&M and at Arizona State, I have uh, friends there from visits some time back, and, uh, uh, and so I'll say hi. <laughs> I'll tell you, when I started working on a book about evolution, I knew so little about the subject that I didn't even realize it was controversial. And I always <laughs> like to start by saying that because I've been continuously surprised given the nature of the project that brought me to the writing of, of uh, a book about evolution that it should be controversial, because I was looking over the shoulders of two extraordinary biologists at Princeton, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who watch evolution happen, watch evolution in action in Darwin's islands with Darwin's finches. Darwin himself didn't think that you could do that. Darwin thought that evolution proceeds far too slowly for anybody to watch. And he says in a famous passage in The Origin, it may metaphorically be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good, silently and insensibly working whenever and wherever opportunity offers. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the lapse of ages. Darwin certainly never saw evolution in action in the Galapagos Islands because he spent only five weeks there, five weeks in the fall of 1835. He arrived September 15th, 1835. He left late October bound for Tahiti. And it was only after he got home that he began to realize that the variation he'd seen in birds in iguanas, in tortoises, in cacti, in the Galapagos Islands, might have had special significance. And in the book he wrote about his voyage around the world on the Beagle, Journal of Researches, now known as The Voyage of the Beagle, he wrote ruefully in his chapter about the islands, it is the fate of most voyagers no sooner to discover what is most interesting in any locality then they are hurried from it. So Darwin spent a good part of his career reconstructing what he might have seen or what he might have been able to put together had he spent more time in the Galapagos Islands. And in The Origin of Species, he argues very logically and beautifully, you can still read the book with pleasure, that variation, the theme of our talk tonight, variation is the cornerstone of all of the change that has produced the fabulous, fabulous variety we see around us in the tree of life. 